Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to Saratoga Investment Corp's 2024 Fiscal Third Quarter Financial Results Conference Call. Please note that today's call is being recorded. During today's presentation, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. Following management's prepared remarks, we will open the line for questions. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Saratoga Investment Corp's Chief Financial and Chief Compliance Officer, Mr. Henry Steenkamp. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you. I would like to welcome everyone to Saratoga Investment Corp's 2024 Fiscal Third Quarter Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference call includes forward-looking statements and projections. We ask you to refer to our most recent filings with the SEC for important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements and projections. We do not undertake to update our forward-looking statements unless required to do so by law. Today, we will be referencing a presentation during our call. You can find our fiscal third quarter 2024 shareholder presentation in the events and presentations section of our investor relations website. A link to our IR page is in the earnings press release distributed last night. A replay of this conference call will also be available. Please refer to our earnings press release for details. I would now like to turn the call over to our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Christian Oberbeck, who will be making a few introductory remarks. Uh, thank you, Henry, <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. Saratoga's adjusted net investment income per share increased 31% as compared to last year, yet decreased slightly as compared to last quarter. The sequential quarterly per share decrease, decrease equates to the $0.07 cents dilution from the increased weighted average shares outstanding from our recent ATM equity issuances, with much of that cash yet to be deployed. This quarterly performance significantly exceeded our recently increased dividend by 40%. The level of interest rates stabilized in the recent quarter, resulting in elevated margins on our growing portfolio relative to the past year. In addition, the continued general contraction of available credit for smaller middle market businesses and our ongoing development of sponsor relationships has created an abundant flow of attractive investment opportunities from high quality sponsors at attractive pricing terms and absolute rates. We believe Saratoga continues to be well positioned for potential future economic opportunities and challenges. Saratoga's credit structure with largely interest only covenant free long duration debt incorporating maturities primarily two to 10 years out, has positioned us well with the increase in interest rates delivering increased margins. Most importantly, at the foundation of our performance is the high quality nature, resilience, and balance of our approximately $1.11 billion portfolio, which has been marked down 3% overall versus cost in this challenging environment. Our core BDC portfolio, excluding our CLO and JD, is down less than 1% versus cost, including markdowns in four specific credits, partially offset by $4.3 million of net realized appreciation in the rest of the core BDC portfolio. This overall portfolio performance reflects the strength of our underwriting and our solid, growing portfolio of companies and sponsors in well-selected industry segments. Our portfolio strength is further manifested in our many key performance indicators this past quarter outlined on slide two, including, first, quarterly adjusted NII increased by 44% and NII per share increased by 24 cents or 31% over the past year. Second, current assets under management grew to approximately $1.11 billion, a record level. And third, our dividends increased to 72 cents per share, up 6% from 68 cents per share in Q3 last year, and over-earned by 40% as compared to this quarter's $1 per share adjusted NII. We continue to approach the market with prudence and discernment in terms of new commitments in the current environment. Our originations this quarter demonstrate that despite an overall robust pipeline, there are periods like the current one where many of the investments we review do not meet our high quality credit standards. We originated no new portfolio investments in this fiscal quarter but had 14 smaller follow-on investments in existing portfolio companies we know well with strong business models and balance sheets. Originations this quarter totaled $36 million, 
with $2 million of repayments and amortization. Our credit quality for this quarter remained high at 97.1% of credits rated in our highest credit category, despite adding our Zolich investment this quarter as our third investment on non-accrual. With 86% of our investments in quarter end, at quarter end in first lien debt and our overall portfolio generally supported by strong enterprise values and balance sheets in industries that have historically performed well in stress situations, we believe our portfolio and leverage is well structured for challenging economic conditions and uncertainty. Saratoga's annualized third quarter dividend of 72 cents per share and adjusted net investment income of $1.01 per share imply an 11% dividend yield and a 15.4% earnings yield based on its recent stock price of 26.16 per share on January 8, 2024. The over-earning of the dividend by 29 cents this quarter, or $1.16 annualized per share, increases NAV, supports the increasing dividend level and growth, and provides a concussion against adverse events. In volatile economic conditions, such as we are currently experiencing, Balance sheet strength, liquidity, and NAV preservation remain paramount for us. First, we raised $48 million of equity since the end of Q1, increasing our NAV from $338 million as of May 31, 2023, to approximately $373 million on a pro forma basis, including the equity raise at the beginning of December, using our November 30th, 2023 NAV as a basis. This equity provides additional balance sheet strength reduces our regulatory leverage, and supports our strong originations. <clears throat> and second, at quarter end, we had a substantial $222 million of investment capacity available to support our portfolio companies, with $145 million available through our newly approved SBIC3 fund, $30 million from our expanded revolving credit facility, and $47 million in cash. Saratoga Investments' third quarter demonstrated solid performance within our key performance indicators as compared to the quarters ended November 30th, 2022 and August 31st, 2023. Our adjusted NII is $13.1 million this quarter, up 44% from last year and down 1% from last quarter. Our adjusted NII per share is $1.01 this quarter, up 31% from 77 cents last year and down 6% from $1.08 last quarter. Latest 12-month return on equity is 6.6%, up from 4% last year, and down from 9.6% last quarter. Our NAV per share is 27.42, down 2.9% from 28.25 last year, and down 3.6% from 28.44 last quarter. And our quarter-end NAV is up to $360 million from $336 million last year, but down slightly from $362 million last quarter. Henry will provide more detail later. As you can see on slide three, our assets under management have steadily and consistently risen since we took over the BDC 13 years ago, and the quality of our credits remains high, with only three credits on non-accrual. Our management team is working diligently to continue this positive trend as we deploy our available capital into our growing pipeline while at the same time being appropriately cautious in this volatile and evolving credit environment. While this past quarter and fiscal year have seen some markdowns to a handful of credits in our core BDC portfolio, as well as our CLL and JV investments in the broadly syndicated loan market, slide four demonstrates how our long-term average return on equity over the past 10 years is well above the BDC industry average and has remained consistently strong over the past decade. With that, I would like to now turn the call back over to Henry to review our financial results, as well as the composition and performance of our portfolio. Thank you, Chris. Slide five highlights our key performance metrics for the fiscal third quarter ended November 30, 2023, most of which Chris already highlighted. Of note, the weighted average common shares outstanding of 13.1 million shares in Q3 increased from 11.9 million last year and 12.2 million last quarter. Adjusted NII increased this quarter, up 43.8% from last year, but down 1% from last quarter, primarily from, first, the impact of higher interest rates, both base rates and spreads, with a weighted average current coupon on non-CLO BDC investments increasing from 11.7% 
to 12.5% year over year and relatively unchanged from last year uh, from last quarter. Second, average non-CLO BDC assets increasing by 15.7% year over year and by 1.6% since last quarter. And third, other income including a $1.3 million dividend received from the Saratoga Investment Joint Venture. Adjusted NII yield was 14.6%. This yield is up from 10.8% last year, but slightly down from 15.0% last quarter. Total expenses for this quarter, excluding interest and debt financing expenses, base management fees and incentive fees, and income and excise taxes, increased from $2.1 million both last quarter and last year to $2.3 million this quarter. This represented 0.8% of average total assets on an annualized basis, unchanged from both Q3 last year and last quarter. Also, we have again added the KPI slides 28 through 31 in the appendix at the end of the presentation that shows our income statement and balance sheet metrics for the past nine quarters and the upward trends we have maintained, including a 57% increase in net interest margin over the past year. Moving on to slide six, NAV was $359.6 million as of this quarter end, a $2.5 million decrease from last quarter, and a $23.8 million increase from the same quarter last year. This quarter, the main drivers of the decrease was the $10 million of equity issued under the ATM program and the $14.2 million of net investment income that was more than offset by $18.2 million of net realized and unrealized losses and $8.4 million of dividends declared net of stock dividend distributions through the company's drip plan. No shares were repurchased during this quarter. This same chart also includes our historical NAV per share, which highlights how this important metric has increased 20 of the past 27 quarters, with Q, <coughs> sorry, with Q3 down a dollar and two cents per share, primarily reflecting the markdowns discussed. Over the long term, our net asset value has steadily increased since 2011, and this growth has generally been accretive, as demonstrated by the consistent increase in NAV per share over the long term. We continue to benefit from our history of consistent realized and unrealized gains. On slide seven, you will see a simple reconciliation of the major changes in adjusted NII and NAV per share on a sequential quarterly basis. Starting at the top, adjusted NII per share was down seven cents, primarily due to the net dilution from the additional 1.2 million shares issued in the recent ATM equity offerings with all the other changes offsetting each other. On the lower half of the slide, NAV per share decreased by $1.02, primarily due to the $1.36 in unrealized depreciation and the $0.71 cents dividend recognized in the quarter, exceeding the $1.09 in GAAP NII. Slide 8 outlines the dry powder available to us as of quarter end, which totaled $222 million. This was spread between our available cash undrawn SBA debentures, and undrawn secured credit facility. This quarter-end level of available liquidity allows us to grow our assets by an additional 20% without the need for external financing. With $47 million of quarter-end cash available and thus fully accretive to NII when deployed and $145 million of available SBA debentures with its low-cost pricing, also very accretive. This quarter, we also added a column showing any call options of our debt. This shows that our $321 million of baby bonds, effectively all our 6% plus debt, is callable within the next year, creating a natural protection against potential future decreasing interest rates, which will protect our net interest margin in a declining rate environment if needed. We remain pleased with our available liquidity and leverage position, including our access to diverse sources of both public and private liquidity, and especially taking into account the overall conservative nature of our balance sheet, the fact that almost all our debt is long-term in nature, and with almost no non-SBIC debt maturing within the next two years. Also, our debt is structured in such a way that we have no BDC covenants that can be stressed during volatile times. 
Now we'd like to move on to slides 9 through 13 and review the composition and yield of our investment portfolio. Slide 9 highlights we now have $1.1 billion of AUM at fair value, and this is invested in 55 portfolio companies, one CLO fund, and one joint venture. Our first lien percentage is 86% of our total investments, of which 32% is in first lien last out positions. On slide 10, you can see how the yield on our core BDC assets, excluding our CLO, has changed over time, especially this past year. This quarter, our core BDC yield was down slightly 10 bips to 12.5%, primarily due to our Zollage investment going on non-accrual, with base rates relatively unchanged. The CLO yield increased to 8.0% from 6.0% last quarter, reflecting the decrease in value from weaker performance. The CLO is performing and current. Slide 11 shows how rates have stabilized the past three months. The average three-month SOFR is now basically the same as the average rate used in our portfolio and the closing quarter end rate. We will continue to benefit from these levels while rates remain elevated and until rates reset. Slide 12 shows our investments are diversified through the US. And on slide 13, you can see the industry breadth and diversity that our portfolio represents, spread over 43 distinct industries, in addition to our investments in the CLO and joint venture, which are included as structured finance securities. Of our total investment portfolio, 8.3% currently consists of equity interests, which remain an important part of our overall investment strategy. Slide 14 shows that for the past 11 fiscal years, we had a combined $81.6 million of net realized gains, primarily from the sale of equity interests. This consistent realized gain performance highlights our portfolio credit quality, has helped grow our NAV, and is reflected in our healthy long-term ROE. That concludes my financial and portfolio review. I will now turn the call over to Michael Grishis, our Chief Investment Officer, for an overview of the investment market. Thank you, Henry. I'll take a few minutes to describe our perspective on the current state of the market and then comment on our current portfolio performance and investment strategy. The overall deal market has remained relatively unchanged since our last update as it seems to be in a bit of a holding pattern to see what happens in the broader macro environment. While liquidity among private equity firms remains abundant, an opaque economic outlook, high financing costs, and elevated levels of inflation continue to constrain the private equity deal market, which drives much of the demand for new credits. Lenders, especially banks, remain more risk sensitive, backing off historically volatile sectors and taking a harder stance on the use of capital, which creates a lending vacuum for borrowers. Overall, lenders are requiring greater equity capitalizations, regardless of the enterprise multiples, and in some cases have reduced their pace of deployment, as well as their hold positions. All of these factors are positive for us and support the confidence we have in our ability to carefully deploy capital in a manner that is accretive to our shareholders. Leverage levels appear to be increasing and remain full for strong credits. The growth in absolute yields appears to have abated, and with fears of an economic slowdown dampening among some market participants, we have seen some lenders offer tighter spreads to win mandates. The Saratoga management team has successfully managed through a number of credit cycles, and that experience has made us particularly aware of the importance of first, being disciplined when making investment decisions, and second, being proactive in managing our portfolio. We're keeping a very watchful eye on how continued inflationary pressures and labor costs, high rates, and a potential economic slowdown could affect both prospective and existing portfolio companies. A natural focus currently remains on supporting our existing portfolio companies through follow-ons. Our underwriting bar remains high as usual, yet we continue to find opportunities to deploy capital Follow-on investments in existing borrowers with strong business models and balance sheets continue to be a healthy avenue of capital deployment, as demonstrated with 69 follow-ons this calendar year, including delayed draws. In addition, we invested in nine new platform investments this calendar year. 
The portfolio management continues to be critically important, and we remain actively engaged with our portfolio companies and in close contact with our management teams, especially in this uncertain market environment. There are a couple of credits specifically that are experiencing varying levels of stress that we have marked down this quarter that I'll touch on shortly. But in general, our portfolio companies are healthy and 83% of our portfolio is generating financial results at or above the prior quarter. This quarter we added our Zollage investment to non-accrual as they missed their October and November interest payments. This means we have three investments on non-accrual including Noland and Pepper Palace. After recognizing the net unrealized depreci depreciation on our overall portfolio this quarter, Saratoga's core BDC portfolio is 0.9% below cost. Despite the write-down of a handful of specific assets this quarter, the remaining portfolio generated $4.3 million of unrealized appreciation, reflecting certain attributes of our portfolio that bolster its overall durability. 86% of our portfolio is in first lien debt and generally supported by strong enterprise values in industries that have historically performed well in stress situations. We have no direct energy or commodities exposure. In addition, the majority of our portfolio is comprised of businesses that produce a high degree of recurring revenue and have historically demonstrated strong revenue retention. Our approach has always been to stay focused on the quality of our underwriting, and as you can see on slide 15, this approach has resulted in our portfolio performance being at the top of the BDC space with respect to net realized gains as a percentage of portfolio at cost. We are only one of 13 BDCs that have had a positive number over the last three years, currently fifth overall. Even taking into account the challenges and corresponding write downs in a few of our portfolio companies, under Saratoga management, the sum total of realized gains and unrealized appreciation have far outstripped realized losses and unrealized depreciation in our core non-CLO portfolio over time. Our internal credit quality rating reflects the impact of current market volatility and shows 97.1% of our portfolio at our highest credit rating as of quarter end. A part of our investment strategy is to selectively co-invest in the equity of our portfolio companies when we're given that opportunity and when we believe in the equity upside potential. This equity co-investment strategy has not only served as yield protection for our portfolio, but also meaningfully augmented our overall portfolio returns, as demonstrated on the slide and a previous one, and we intend to continue this strategy. Now, looking at leverage on slide 16, you can see that industry debt multiples have come down this year from their historically high levels. Total leverage for our overall portfolio was 4.3 times, excluding Nolan, Pepper Palace, and Solage, while the industry is now again at, at above five times leverage. In addition, this slide illustrates the strength of our deal flow and our consistent ability to generate new investments over the long term, despite ever-changing and, and increasing competitive market dynamics. During the fourth calendar quarter, we added no new portfolio companies and made 15 follow-on investments. Despite the success we're having investing in highly attractive businesses and growing our portfolio and the healthy deal flow we are seeing, it is important to emphasize that, as always, we're not aiming to grow simply for growth's sake, especially in the face of uncertain macroeconomic environments. Our capital deployment bar is always high and is conditioned upon healthy confidence that each incremental investment is in a durable business and will be accretive to our shareholders. Slide 17 provides more data on our deal flow previously discussed, demonstrating how our team's skill set, experience, and relationships continue to mature, and our significant focus on business development has led to multiple new strategic relationships that have become sources for new deals. Five of the nine new portfolio companies over the past 12 months are from newly formed relationships, reflecting notable progress as we expand our business development efforts. The significant progress we've made in building broader and deeper relationships in the marketplace is noteworthy because it strengthens the dependability of our deal flow and reinforces our ability to remain highly selective as we rigorously screen opportunities to execute on the best investments. As you can see on slide 18, our overall portfolio credit quality 
remains solid. As you can see on the chart on the left, the gross unleveraged IRR on realized investments made by the Saratoga Investment Management Team is 15.7% on $917 million of realizations. On the chart on the right, you can see the total gross unlevered IRR on our $1.2 billion of combined weighted SBIC and BDC unrealized investments is 10.9%, including the markdowns of this quarter. Notably, the unleveraged IRR on the combined realized and unrealized $2.1 billion of capital invested by the Saratoga management team is 13.8%. We now have three investments on non-accrual, with Pepper Palace classified as red and Nolan and Zolich as yellow. Nolan has been yellow for a while, and no significant change to the, to the Q2 mark occurred. Pepper Palace continued to suffer from poor performance and liquidity issues, reflecting the $4.1 million markdown this quarter. We are working with a sponsor and a financial advisor to assess future options and evaluate the ongoing viability and profitability potential of the business in the current consumer retail environment. The remaining fair value of this investment is $5 million. Zolich started facing liquidity issues this quarter, resulting in its inability to pay its October and November interest on time, which has led us to move this to non-accrual. Despite recent challenges, we believe that the core Zolich business model and value proposition remain solid, evidenced by the company's reasonably stable student enrollment trends. In addition to these non-accrual investments, we also want to highlight two other investments that we marked down this quarter. We marked our Netro investment down by $8.3 million, of which $6.1 million was the reversal of appreciation previously recognized in our common equity. This markdown reflects a combination of factors, including recent weaker financial performance and a significantly lower market multiple due to changing market conditions. We continue to believe that all of our debt is covered by the enterprise value of the business and that the ultimate equity realization will be determined by market factors and company performance. We also marked down our ETU investment by $1.8 million, primarily related to our equity position. This reflects weaker financial performance driven by lower revenue growth than expected amid a weaker macro selling environment for corporate learning and development. The company has a blue chip customer base, and we continue to believe that the business offers market leading technology and a unique value proposition within this space. In addition, the CLO and JB have had a $6.5 million of unrealized depreciation, primarily driven by the performance of certain individual credits in the broadly syndicated loan portfolio. Of note is that the rest of the core BDC portfolio has continued to perform well, resulting in $4.3 million of net unrealized appreciation across our remaining 50 portfolio companies. 82% of our portfolio is gen generating financial results at or above the prior quarter. Our overall investment approach has yielded exceptional realized returns and recovery of our invested capital, and our long-term performance remains strong, as seen by our track record on this slide. Moving on to slide 19, you can see our first and second SBIC licenses are fully funded and deployed, with our first license recently surrendered, we are currently ramping up our new SBIC3 license with $145 million of lower cost, undrawn debentures available, allowing us to continue to support U.S. small businesses. This concludes my review of the market, and I'd like to turn the call back over to our CEO. Chris? Uh, thank you, Mike. As outlined on slide 20, our latest dividend of $0.72 cents per share for the quarter ended November 30th, 2023, was paid on December 28, 2023. This is the largest quarterly dividend in our history and reflects a 6% and 36% increase over the past one and two years, respectively. The Board of Directors will continue to evaluate the dividend level on at least a quarterly basis, considering both company and general economic factors, including the current interest rate environment's impact on our earnings. 
Recognizing the divergence of opinions on when interest rate cuts will commence and at what pace, and the expected overall economic, economic performance, Saratoga's Q3 over-earning of its dividend by 40%, or $1.01 per share versus $0.72 cents per share this quarter, provides a substantial cushion should economic conditions deteriorate or base rates decline. Moving to slide 21, our total return over the last 12 months, which includes both capital appreciation and dividend, has generated total returns at 14%, uncharacteristically underperforming the BDC index at 30% for the same period. Our longer-term performance is outlined on our next slide, 22. Our three- and five-year returns place us in the top quartile of all BDCs for both time horizons. Over the past three years, our 66% return exceeded the average index return of 45%. Over the past five years, our 100% return exceeded the index's average of only 64%. Since Saratoga took over management of the BDC in 2010, our total return has been 712% versus the industry's 241%. On slide 23, you can further see our performance placed in the context of the broader industry and specific to certain key performance metrics. We continue to focus on our long-term metrics such as return on equity, NAV per share, NII yield, and dividend growth and coverage, all of which reflects the growing value our shareholders are receiving. While NAV per share is down 2.9% this past year, we continue to be one of the few BDCs to have grown NAV over the long term and we have done it accretively. Moving on to slide 24, all of our initiatives discussed on this call are designed to make Saratoga Investment a leading BDC that is attractive to the capital markets community. We believe that our differentiated performance characteristics outlined on this slide will help drive the size and quality of our investor base, including adding more institutions. These differentiating characteristics, many previously discussed, include maintaining one of the highest levels of management ownership in the industry at 13%, ensuring we are aligned with our shareholders. Looking ahead on slide 25, we remain confident that our reputation, experienced management team, historically strong underwriting standards, and time and market-tested investment strategy will serve us well in navigating through the challenges and uncovering the opportunities in the current and future environment and that our balance sheet, capital structure, and liquidity will benefit Saratoga shareholders in the near and long term. In closing, I would again like to thank all of our shareholders for their ongoing support, and I would like to now open the call for questions. To ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from Eric Zwick with Hofti Group. Your line is now open. Good morning, everyone. I want to start first with a question um, on the pipeline. I wonder if you could um, kind of break out how you characterize it, the, the opportunities that are you know, you know, likely to enter the portfolio in terms of new investments versus uh, existing. It sounds like at, at this point, you know, based on what transpired in the last quarter, there's certainly – more attractive opportunities to uh, extend, um, you know, to existing investments. And curious if your, you know, kind of near-term outlook for the next quarter or two is similar, or if you're seeing some more attractive opportunities uh, for, for new investments. That's a good question. Um, we are continuing to see good opportunities to deploy capital. We didn't find anything in this past quarter, and that was mostly reflective of the fact that that uh, the deals that we saw in terms of the leverage that they were looking for relative to the strength of the business model. Um, we just couldn't get comfortable and didn't, didn't pass our underwriting bar. Um, I think uh, I, I wouldn't say that that's characteristic of, of our pipeline in general, but that certainly was characteristic of what we ended, where we ended up this past quarter. Um, the pace of investment that we're experiencing is certainly being influenced to some degree by uh, lower deal activity just in general in the middle market. Um, we're still seeing a disconnection between 
you know, what value sellers think that they ought to fetch and, and what buyers are willing to pay in this market. So there's not, we're not seeing as much deal volume as we've seen historically, but we still are seeing you know, healthy activity and have confidence that we'll, we'll find opportunities to deploy capital. That's helpful, thank you. And then you mentioned in the, the comments in one of the slides that you've got you know, quite a bit of liquidity on hand right now and the ability to potentially grow AUM as, as much as 20% without harnessing um, or kind of tapping the external financing. Just curious, is that you know, a, a goal to actually get that full 20%? Um, you know, and if so, over what, what time horizon would you expect to, uh, to put that to work? You know, it's well, interesting. Think- we- Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Mike. Uh, just you know, at, at, at a very high level, um, you know, we've tried to run our business with you know ample liquidity to take advantage of opportunities, and um, so uh, you know, we, we we have we have you know the dry powder available. Um, we have a you know a, a large you know um, group of portfolio companies that continue to grow, as you saw this past uh, quarter. Uh, there's a lot of follow-on opportunities. We're financing a number of build-ups, and and so those we want to make sure that we're there for and available to be there for for our portfolio companies. You know when they when they when they need the capital. Um, you know uh, for for whatever reason, mostly positive reasons. Um, but we, but so we want to have that available for that, and then we also want to be available for for new opportunities for our existing relationships and for building new ones. And um, so that's a, that's a stance we've kind of maintained for, you know, for really the whole time, you know, the last 13 years. Um, and that's what we continue to maintain. As to the pace of deployment and our expectations for that, I mean, that's, that's sort of not in our control. I mean, I think as Mike, you know, said just earlier, you know, we had a lot of opportunities. We could have put out a whole lot more money this past quarter, but um, we were saved from doing so. So we're going to pick our spots. We're going to, you know, support you know, our portfolio companies, you know, you know, when merited and um, we're going to be, uh, you know, selective, uh, you know, going forward. So unfortunately we can't give you a, a hard uh, forecast for when and how we would deploy that. And it's really going to be, you know, subject to the opportunity set, both from our existing portfolio and from new opportunities. The only thing I'd add to that too, just to, just to augment that is that, um, you know, you had asked if, if they had a goal to deploy that additional capital. We tend not to think about our business that way, as, as Chris was um, explaining. We just really um, set ourselves up for the best opportunities we can to, to deploy capital in a way that we feel very comfortable be accretive to our shareholders um, and let the rest take care of itself. But, you know, definitely don't set goals around, you know, kind of, where we want to move the balance sheet. It's really more a function of what opportunities we see. And if we see those, we certainly want to avail ourselves and, and let the, of those opportunities and let the shareholders benefit from it. Got it. And one last one, and I'll step aside. Just in terms of the, uh, the Zolage investment, um, yeah, I think I didn't get the exact quote, but I think you mentioned you know, the core business and operating trends remain solid, but they did miss uh, the two uh, interest monthly interest payments. So just curious, it's kind of balancing those two. What led to their decision to to skip those payments, and um, you know, any time frame expectations for for when they might return to to accrual? The company is expa- uh, experiencing some execution and cost challenges that have constrained their liquidity, um, and we're working with the sponsor uh, and management on some initiatives to improve performance. Um, but the, the decision certainly was made as a result of those liquidity challenges to, you know, suspend interest payments. Um, we are, uh, in, as we look at the core business, though, a lot of the fundamentals that we originally liked in the business remain intact. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, a lot of stability in, in terms of student starts and enrollment and things that you, you know, point to fundamentally to, to feel comfortable that the, the business model has a, you know, compelling value proposition for its its customers, uh, but work to do on the execution side. Can't can't really put a date or time around, uh, you know, kind of a time frame for improved performance, but that's what we're focused on for sure. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. One moment for our next question.
Our next question comes from Mickey Schlein with Ladenberg Fallon. Your line is now open. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to follow up on your comments on NetRio. Um, it sounded like you uh, attributed uh, most of the decline in valuation to comparable valuation, but I saw in the queue that you also mentioned higher leverage. Uh, was that due to declining EBITDA or a bank coming in ahead of you, or could, could you just uh, expand on that, please? Uh, there's higher leverage because we've been supporting the, the growth of the business uh, with our own debt, so there's nothing that's come in in front of us, but there is a higher debt load. Um, most of the change, just to reiterate, in value was, was due to a, a, a change in multiple. As we looked at macro factors and just where valuation is, um, combined with uh, you know, lesser performance of the underlying business, and then, you know, the thing I'd point out to Mickey is that uh, the vast majority of that write-down was reversal of appreciation that we had, unrealized appreciation that we had uh, before that. I understand. Um, thanks. thanks for that, Mike. Um, your last fiscal quarter also includes uh, December, which is historically, you know, the busiest month of the year um, for BDCs. Um, could you give us any sense of how active you were in December in terms of fulfilling your pipeline? I mean, we, we tend not to, to get into that, that detail post quarter end, but I think um, we've continued to support our portfolio companies, kind of consistent with what we've done in the past. Haven't seen a whole lot of, of change in, in sort of what you saw through the, the last uh, reported quarter. Okay, my last question uh, is in regards to the um, notes coming due in March. Uh, I understand that they're extendable at your discretion uh, for a year. Um, those are at 8.75. I'm just trying to understand whether you're more predisposed to trying to refinance those or um, just extend them for a year and see how rates go. Yeah, I, I don't think we've made a decision on that yet. You know, we've still got two and a half months to go, um, Mickey. So I think we're still sort of considering our options, but it's obviously nice to have the flexibility um, with an instrument like that, especially a short-term instrument like that. I understand. And I, I could, if I could just add also to that, I, mean, I, I, um, I, I think, you know, inside of that, that optionality to do that, I think that's something that, uh, you know, that, that, that we try and preserve. I think Henry did a very good job in negotiating that. You know, to allow us that option. I mean, it could have been straight up to your, you know, facility, but we gave ourselves the option to to to, to be able to repay it. So I think it's reflective of, of how we think about our capital structure relative to potential changes uh, in interest rates. Uh, the other thing I would say, and this is sort of a broader, you know, concept that's you know, running through the broader marketplace and the BDC marketplace, is you know, what is the course of uh, interest rates next year? What you know? What what do people expect? What what's going to happen? And and I, and I think the you know the core answer is, is is that nobody really knows. I think if you were to put up the charts of all the forecasts of you know short term interest rate cuts uh, you know that have been forecast over the last several years, I think they've been universally wrong. Um, so so we we just don't know you know enough right now about you know the the, the market right for 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 debt instruments. To make that call, and you know, just look what's happened in the last two and a half months. You know what people would have said uh, or did say, you know, two and a half months ago, and what they've been saying, you know, last couple of weeks is is pretty radically different. And um, you know, there's a lot of more information we're going to get before we have to make the call on that, as as Henry said. Uh, so you know, we're we're going to wait till the you know till right up up to it, and obviously evaluate you know all, all our financing alternatives relative to that extension. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I know I know that we don't know where interest rates are going to go, and um, uh, I understand your rationale. And, and I suppose it's similar with the uh, undistributed taxable income you seem to be carrying, right, Henry? That That's something you'll evaluate, you know, sort of, I guess, in the middle of this year. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we actually we talk about it the whole time. And, um, uh, again, it's, it's being able to have 
optionality and flexibility, especially at a time like this where one's sort of at a moment in the market where, you know, a lot could be changing. It might not. It might, but it's just nice to have that flexibility right now. I understand. That, that's it for me this morning. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mikey. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Robert Dodd with Raymond James. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, first question, if I can, on, on leverage. Obviously, you've, you've brought the late yield theory leverage down a, 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 a bit versus where it was a couple of quarters. I mean, the, the, with raising equity and the manager um, uh, supporting that financially. Um, so are you, is this an area where you're, you're kind of, we should expect you to remain comfortable in the 160s, or is it contingent on the market? If the market gets more active, you're willing to go higher again on the regulatory leverage side or can you give us any any thought i know you don't give us an explicit target but some some framework thoughts around where we should expect leverage to to play out sure um you know i, I think that again that is you know as we a answer the last question that's something we think about talk about you know continuously um i think also just going back to uh, you know a consistent theme on this call and, and and all of our prior calls, is that you know we we tend not to forecast and project what our deployment is going to be um, against any kind of you know goal uh, per se. Um, you know we we have we, we try and uh, you, you know we try and address each opportunity you know as it as it comes and um, and as you can see in the last quarter we you know we declined to make you know further new platform investment um you know that wasn't driven by uh you know any you know broader um sort of metrics that we're, we're operating to it but it really was sort of on a case-by-case -case basis uh, us not you know not seeing the risk reward um situation you know fitting within what we felt it should fit it within uh and and, and we will continue that going forward so we we, we really you know you know, it's possible we may see some tremendously opportunistic deals coming our way, in which case we would be favorably inclined. Um, but, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're going to be judicious and prudent, as we said, about how we deploy relative to sort of everything. Obviously, leverage is a factor, um, and opportunity is a factor, and credit quality is a factor. So, again, it's, it's difficult for us to ask answer that question for you prospectively, because it's it's going to be a function of the opportunities that are presented, you know, or that we generate for ourselves. Got it. Thank you. I think that that actually is pretty clear. I appreciate that. On on the two two, I do want to ask a couple of questions of Zolich and, and Netrio. So on Zolich, was there any um, negotiation with the, the sponsor as to whether to 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 not pay or to 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 be potentially pick the interest if this is a transitory cost issue that you believe is fixable, um, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, was a pick toggle considered as option? Not that I'm saying in favor, but, you know, the, the straight to not paying the interest when, when pick has been increasing across the industry, there's more and more of it. It wouldn't have stood out that much if you'd done it. I mean, can you give us any, any thoughts on, on why that either didn't come up in your view or, or was rejected? Well, we're, you know, it's, it's a good question. You know, we're continuing to work with the sponsor and the management team in, in terms of, you know, one, focusing on improved performance this year, um, and, then, and then the general, you know, direction that the business is going to go. Um, it's, it's interesting. If, if we were to convert to a pick toggle, let's say, in that case, typically that, that kind of discussion becomes one where you're, you're agreeing to not get paid your interest, um, and, and you're hoping to get something in exchange for it. I, I think our mm -hmm. view is that that you know at this point that interest is due, so it's it's the, the from a legal perspective, the the interest is accruing um, legally, not from an accounting perspective because they're not paying on a current basis, but that that interest is still due to us. Um, if we were to convert to, in, in any of these negotiations, if you were to convert to a pick toggle, 
you're sort of saying to the sponsor, it's okay not to pay us, and we're, we're fine with that. Um, given all the circumstances here and the fact that we're not being paid, we prefer to be in a position where, um, you know, kind of we own a default, if you will, and it allows us to, to um, negotiate uh, kind of the course of action from a better position of strength at this juncture. Got it. I appreciate that. And then on, on NetMeo, I mean, if we look back, yeah, two years ago, um, the, the, the asset was marked well well above cost across the, all the security tranches, and you've put in additional capital a couple of times um, uh, since then, and it seems like it's been on a gradual valuation um, deterioration from, from where it was uh, two years ago. So it, it just it, it looks like today it's, it's not performing how you thought it would um, over a pretty long, prolonged period, and it's been gradual deterioration. Um, I mean, what, what, what's in the works to, to, to fix that? I mean, I understand your, your, your comments. You think the, the, the equity market is primarily um, uh, comps and performance. But, it, yeah, it's been, I think, 25% of your unrealized appreciation over the last two years, that one asset. Um, the NAV performance would have been noticeably better if this asset had been performing better. So what, what, what is it that's the problem that, still doesn't seem to have been resolved over, over a couple of years. Um, I'll try to, uh, try to be careful in terms of, uh, you know, what I realize it's a sponsor people. investment and you don't want to say too much, but anything you can would be appreciated. Sure. sure. So if you think about valuation of this business and, and we have a material, you know, component of the equity here, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the driver of a value of a business like this is the rate of growth. And then there's also just macro multiples um, that affect the, the value in general. In this case, um, it's not that the business's performance has deteriorated um, uh, in a really meaningful way, but they have faced growth challenges. So um, for a business where a lot of that value driver is dependent upon continued growth, when that growth um, gets dialed back, the valuation multiple has to come in, unfortunately, and that's what we've experienced here. When you couple that with an overall um, uh, decline in valuation multiples in the, in the macro environment, uh, the combination of those things has, has caused the, the value to come down. So we're obviously very disappointed because we were you know, quite excited about the appreciation that we were experiencing in this, this asset. We think that the primary volatility around it is in the equity, um, of course, but and uh, uh, the, the vast majority of our, our capital is in the debt. Got it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Casey Alexander with Compass Point Research and Trading. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Um, first question uh, with a little series of questions here. Um, there was a quarter over quarter reduction in PIC income. Uh, can you tell us what that is attributable to? Just trying to look at it here. I think it was actually big part of it was Zollage, I think. There was a, a, a pick component to Zollage as well, Katie, and so obviously going on to non-accrual, we also uh, stopped the pick on Zollage. I mean, pick is very right. small in general for us, so it has an outsized impact just because, not that it was a huge pick amount, but it has an outsized impact because the overall amount is. Okay, that's, that, that's fine, thank you. Secondly, um, are, are you, do you, as a Part of your optionality, is a deemed dividend considered part of that optionality for some of the uh, back income? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by deemed dividend, uh, Casey? I, well, I think you know what I mean. You mean cash or non-cash? Uh, uh, yes, a non-cash dividend. Um, well, I think, you know, you, you're – obviously know that that is an option yeah absolutely that you know the 
statutory requirements for for BDCs to pay um, pay out anything is you know is is it has an option for uh, a stock issuance. So that that is uh, you know statutory option that is out there. We have not made a decision one way or the other on how to address that. Okay. Uh, does the JV own any Pepper Palace or Zollage? No. No. Okay. Is is the CLO um, experiencing when you talk about um, individual credits? It, has it experienced actual defaults in the CLO? Uh, no, it's mainly been, it's not necessarily defaulting assets, but uh, the market price of a handful of assets has deteriorated significantly from a mark to market, which then makes it uh, classified as a default for purposes of the valuation, which obviously lowers the principal cash flows that you use in your valuation. So in essence, it, it's, it's the bid price that puts it in, in violation of a CLO measuring stick. Is that what you, what you mean? Well, just for valuation purposes. So if a mark moves from, let's say, 80 to 50, it's not necessarily in default from a payment terms perspective, but for purposes of our valuation, we treat it as a default. So we take its cash flows out of the valuation. Okay, great. All right. And then, and then Chris, I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite you to take this opportunity to have kind of an open discussion with your shareholders about the manner in which you guys are raising equity um, and, you know, why you think a shareholder should be comfortable with the manner in which you're raising equity in the market. Sure. And I think it's a you know, very good question. Um, I guess, you know, when we started 13 years ago, I think the, the BDC had – $50 million of, uh, of equity, and uh, today we're at $373 million of equity. And the bulk of that has come through share issuances over time, and, and fortunately, uh, we've also had some very good success in terms of capital gains, and so retention of capital gains has also contributed to that. And over that period of time, you know, we've taken um, the BDC from kind of a inconsequential BDC to certainly consequential relative to our our niche in the marketplace, if you will, but we're, you know, we're substantially larger than we were. We were like 80 something million. Now we're, you know, a billion one. And so we've built our franchise very substantially. And um, as you know, um, and as you point out, um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's leverage capabilities in, in a BDC that have limits. And, uh, and in order to grow, one has to, one has to raise equity. Uh, you know, to 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 grow, and uh, and we have done that over time, and pretty much we've done it when we can, when we can and when we could have, and the results, I think, if you look at our, you know, performance, uh, total return performance, I think all all the equity, you know, relative to almost every period. I mean, if you get to super short periods, um, you know, trading and things like that, you know, you know, less than a year, less than six months, maybe it's a problem. But I think if you look at annual periods or, or, or multi-year periods for all the parties that have invested in our equity and stayed with it for, for you know, for, you know, a year or more, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that every single person has had a very, very sizable returns and, and, and generally speaking has outperformed, you know, the, 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 the you know, the industry average of, of the BDC. So, so we think um, all our equity issuances have, have been, uh, you know, um, you know, accretive if you will, for people that bought that stock, that it, it's gone up in a total return basis. Um, I think, you know, if you look at our stock right now, um, you know, we're, we have a you know, close to 16% earnings yield. Um, that's a, you know, very substantial, you know, earnings yield, which I think is, is you know, is helping to, you know, you know build our, um, you know, build our equity, uh, cover our dividend by 40%. So I think the stock is, you know, certainly, a, you know, from our standpoint, in our internal ownership, very, very, very attractive stock to own. Now we have traded, you know, below NAV, um, and uh, as you know, uh, you know, one, you know, doesn't issue stock, can't issue stock below NAV at the BDC level. And so, as a manager, this past year, you know, we've issued, you know, about fifty million dollars of stock, and the manager itself has, has invested, uh, 
four and a half million dollars uh, to basically um, support or subsidize that so that the BDC, when it sells that stock, gets uh, 100% of NAV. And I think that that um, investment uh, by the manager is reflective of our uh, belief in the business. And in essence, it's an investment by the manager in our equity, in our business, in the growth uh, and opportunities um, that, you know, that we see in the business. And, you know, I think if you look across the shareholders, we're not selling stock. I, mean, I think, you know, I've, my stock has declined, but most of the stock I own has declined uh, as a result of issuances to the management team. So, so we are long-term equity owners, equity holders, uh, equity buyers. Many of us reinvest in our stock. So we're believers in our own stock. Uh, the manager is a very firm believer, having invested more in that stock. And, um, and you know, there's obviously, you know, there's two, you know, there's more things than this, but there's two, two things, obviously, that we have to watch for. One is growth, um, you know, and, and without equity as the cornerstone, given leverage limitations on BDCs, we can't grow unless we have equity. And so we've been issuing equity to support our growth. And our growth has been a profitable growth, I think. You know, obviously, this quarter, um, you know, a lot of things converged. Uh, and, and so, you know, they, you know, not the best news this quarter relative to some others. But if you look over the long, long haul, um, you know, we've had very, very positive performance, which we expect to continue. And, um, you know, we're very, we're very sanguine about the opportunities, you know, in our field. But in order to grow, you know, we, we need to issue equity. And so we took advantage of some opportunities, including our willingness to invest to, to support the BDC, you know, in the, in the past period of time. The other element, which you and, and others have commented on, is uh, the leverage uh, ratios that Saratoga has, and we kind of have a statutory leverage, and we also have a, um, you know, you know, uh, that we have to comply with, and then, you know, because of certain technicalities with SBIC counting, um, <laughs> we could borrow more than the uh, statutory uh, limits, you know, for a regular way BDC are, and so we have um, historically taken advantage of that opportunity. Uh, you know, over the long run, and it's it's worked out very very well for us. Uh, we've had lots of discussions on these calls about you know the character of our leverage, and and you know a lot of people point to absolute leverage and say, okay, your leverage is X, you know, and 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 that's quote too high or higher than everybody else and things like that. And and we have said, well, um, yeah, at a point in time that's right, but uh, but if you look at the dynamic of our leverage and the and the term structure of our leverage. And the absence of covenants, and the absence of mark to markets, and the absence of uh, of advance rates, and all those types of things, um, our leverage is 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 very well structured, and very well structured for you know horror shows like you know when we had in COVID, you know when when when, the, when everything sort of fell apart. I mean, we were able to go forward and put money to work and support our our portfolio companies and support our sponsors because our leverage structure was you know very solid and was not being perturbed by, you know, the external environment. We're very prominent BDCs in our, uh, you know, our universe. Uh, they had to write checks to cover, you know, out of, out of uh, formula uh, asset-based uh, loan requirements to, you know, to basically stay in business. And so, so, so I think our, our, our leverage structure has been time and event tested. And, um, and, and, and so, uh, but, but, you know, so we're very comfortable with it, as we've said many times. And, um, however, um, you know, it, there is there there are absolute metrics associated with leverage, and the issuance of equity basically uh, allow us to you know have more either cushion in a in a down environment or support opportunity in an up environment or upset of opportunities environment. So um, uh, I think we've been very um, I think our equity performance, I think, is, is I mean, I, I think it's been very good all along for anyone who's ever gotten into the stock, and we would anticipate anyone who's bought this stock, um, you know, recently uh, will will share in that performance, and um, and we think our stock is, uh, you know, we 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 don't we don't think uh, people are looking at it the right way, and um, you know, where else are you going to get, you know, 16% earnings yield, uh, at, you know, at, at at this point in time. Um, uh, you, you know, with with the type of uh, you know historical performance and portfolio that we have assembled, so so we think uh, we think Saratoga is a very good value at this point in time. 
Well, I appreciate that answer. I, I'm looking at slide 21, and, you know, the period of out, underperformance of Saratoga relative to the BDC index kind of clearly corresponds with the time period where you've been in the market and selling stock at, you know, around 90% of book. So can you, can you explain until a shareholder is confident that you're no longer in the market at 90% of the book? And, look, I appreciate the fact that you're making up the difference at the manager. I understand that fully. But you're still supplying the market at 90% of the book. So can, can, can you tell me as a shareholder why I should be willing to pay more than 90% of book if I know that you're willing to sell stock at 90% of book? Well, when you say you, um, I, 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 the BDC is not selling at 90% of book. Uh, the, the, okay, BDC is selling. Okay, at uh, I, I, that's fine. That's and fine. by the way, and by the way, Casey, that that, I, that I, that's your answer. That's your answer. And, and, but Casey, just by the way, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm not sure your your headline of your the, report. Quite the supply is coming into the market at 90 percent of book. Okay, you're making up the difference, but the supply is coming into the market at 90 percent of book. That's where we know the supply is coming. All right, so explain to me and, and, and why and someone the, should be willing to pay more than that. Well, the BDC until they're is, confident that you're no longer in the market at that level. Well, first of all, I'll just say that the, but the, but it's going into the BDC at 100 cents. So the BDC is getting a. I'm uh, aware of that. I already okay. acknowledge that. Okay, and then um, you know whether in the, we're in the market or you know or not. I mean. Um, yeah, you know, we can't say. You know, just as we've answered these other questions about, um, you know, uh, about uh, the, um, you know, what are, you know, how, what are we going to deploy over the next period of time and our targets versus leverage, you know, it's 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 a it's a consistent answer relative to this, which is it's going to be a, a, a it's going to be a set of opportunities. I mean, these stock sales were done in blocks. These were not um, these these were not like open market. Sales. These were block sales to specific investors with long-term investment outlooks. So, you know, in terms of you know, float and all those types of things, and you know, you know, again, you know, we're not driving what those investors are thinking and how they're doing it. But, but um, you know, those investors aren't buying in blocks at this scale. Um, you know, to then kind of trade out much in, in the volume situation of our stock okay so 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 we, we believe they're they're long-term investors so so on the one hand you're saying oh yes yeah, it's, it's adding to the supply but it's adding to the supply of people that are are long-term holders they're not i mean it's it, it's not such a great idea to buy a big block and then try and get out of it right away i mean as you know all right uh, so, well, so, let me so, ask so you these, what, look, these let me ask you one more question sure. all right the, the 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 shares that you have already sold in the fourth quarter okay Will will you be um, making up the difference to an NAV of twenty eight forty four or twenty seven forty two? The manager. 20, that's a higher number, right, Henry? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thanks for taking my questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Bryce Rowe with B. Riley. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks. Good, good morning. Um, don't necessarily want to extend the call here, but, but did want to ask a couple questions. Um, I want, want to follow up on, the, on that last discussion with Casey. Um, you know, Chris, certainly understand uh, the, the quality of the leverage profile um, and, and do acknowledge that, uh, that, that balance sheet leverage is Absolute, is, is, on an absolute basis, is elevated relative to the space, um, and appreciate that you all are subsidizing the um, the, the equity issuance here to, to allow the BDC to take it at 100% of NAV. To what extent are you, um, you know, is is the manager willing to subsidize subsidize, especially with the stock now down in the you know let's call it 80%, 85% of, of NAV range now. Well, again, you know, that's a perspective question, and I hope you appreciate that we have to be very careful on what we say we're going to do prospectively. Um, 
I, I think, you know, much like our investment, uh, you know, discussions, um, you know, selling stock is, is also similar. I mean, in other words, it's not our decision to sell stock. We need a buyer on the other side that's, you know, ready to, you know, to, to acquire. And as we said before, uh, the stock sales have been in blocks. Um, you know, we haven't been selling stock, you know, just we haven't been like having a sell, uh, you know, in the open market every day. Okay, well, that's not what we've been doing to, to, to achieve these sales. And we are very cognizant of, you know, of trading volumes and things like that. These, these are These are specific sales by appointment as opposed to us, you know, sort of saying, okay, we're going to sell all this stock, you know, to anybody all day and just having an open sell order. No. So these, these so, so these arguably have been sort of off market, right? In other words, the stock has been traded in blocks and it hasn't really affected the market. It's a separate, separate kind of trade. So, you know, we obviously, you know, are very sensitive to, you know, you know, where our stock trades, you know, how our stockholders uh, are, tra- are, you know, are effectively are, are, are affected by, you know, these events. We've been very thoughtful and careful about that. And we think that that is very, very positive for the company. But we're, we're really excited. Um, and we're also, you know, we're sort of slightly puzzled by um, getting so much pushback on selling equity when, um, you know, analysts like yourselves are asking us about our leverage ratio. Uh, we would think we would get, you know, maybe more, you know, plaudits for um, for raising equity uh, that is uh, you know improving that that metric on that uh, on that side. Um, you know, recognizing that you know the next question everyone has is like, well, are you going to deploy it and increase your leverage again? And our answer has always been, you know, we will or we won't, depending on the opportunity set. And and I think what's what's missing from in our mind from a lot of this discussion we have. You know, it, it's sort of like risk-adjusted returns, right? In other words, you can have an absolute return, you know, of X, but the question is, how risky is X? And 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 so, on a risk-adjusted basis, you know, uh, you know, X risk might be X plus, you know, 50% risk, you know, or it might be X, you know. And so, and so on our and our on our leverage structure, it's sort of similar. Like, what is our risk-adjusted leverage? And if you if you if you compare our leverage at a, at, a, at fixed rates and and with the term structure the absence of covenants, you know, all those types of things, um, you know, you say, okay, well, let's compare that to another BDC that has, you know, a a tremendous amount of bank leverage uh, with, you know, asset-based formulas, Uh, you know, what, 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 you know, and and let's say their, their leverage is, you know, is, 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 you know, you know, substantially less than our leverage, but if they get a bunch of markdowns, you know, they're going to have a default in that credit facility. Uh, and, and, and if we had the exact same portfolio and the exact same markdowns, we wouldn't have a default. So, so, so on a risk-adjusted leverage basis, we think our leverage is, 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 should be discounted. In other words, you shouldn't take the absolute number of our, of our leverage and say that's what their leverage is. You should put a discount on that because of the structure relative to the BDC industry because the BDC industry has a tremendous amount of essentially bank leverage. And you look at when people have gotten into trouble – most of that trouble has come from bank leverage, uh, you know, when assets have to be marked down and things come out of formula. So, so, so anyway, so, so we feel our leverage is, is, um, is on a risk adjusted basis should be, you know, substantially discounted from the absolute number. Understood that. Uh, appreciate that. Um, maybe I'll just move on to another topic here. Henry, um, the, the, the quarterly dividend income, uh, you, you called out 1.3 million, uh, from the from the senior loan fund, um, you know, there there was a you know an additional let's call it five hundred thousand dollars that came in there. Is that is that you know would, would we characterize that as kind of recurring in nature or is that more one time? Yeah, there's there's one portfolio company that regularly pays us um, a, a dividend every quarter, but it's more a hundred a hundred and fifty. I'd say the additional piece, uh, you're right, Bryce, was sort of a. Uh, it, it definitely not, it won't be recurring every quarter. It was a, it was another one of our portfolio companies who distributed um, some of their excess um, cash flow from operations. Okay, that's that's helpful. One one more for me, um, and, and certainly understand you're not going to you know give specific guidance around kind of repayments, um, but we've you know or, or exits, but we've we've seen you know relatively muted activity on the repayment exit side for the last few quarters, um, understandably so. Now, can, can you speak to, and maybe this is a question for Mike, but can you speak to kind of the, 
um, you know, the, the market activity right now within the portfolio is their interest in potential exits. Um, and, you know, if, if there is, can you kind of speak to maybe the, the, the velocity or, or the probability of, of stuff kind of coming, coming, uh, coming to market over the, over the next little bit? Thanks. Hey, Bryce, this is Mike. Um, as it relates to that, it's, it's a bit of a question mark, right? I think that's going to coincide with uh, the overall deal market picking up. Um, so really hard to tell. Um, I would say some of the things that we look at is for some of our assets, they've been in sponsor ownership for a period of time. Um, so at some point, um, even if they feel like they're not going to optimize the valuation uh, relative to what they would have gotten 18 months ago or a couple years ago, let's say, um, they're, they're going to be inclined to exit. So we think that at some point, um, you know, that'll turn and, and, and probably we'll start to see some, some uh, redemptions within our portfolio. Um, at the same time that that starts to occur, we would expect, and this is just naturally how it tends to work, that deal volume in general will pick up. And so we'll be a little bit back on that uh, typical cadence that we have where <laughs> we're getting redemptions and then our origination activity has to out, you know, outstrip that, which it has comfortably for a long time now. Um, but right now we're in a position where deal volume and originations are, are skewing more toward um, supporting our portfolio companies, which we're delighted by, and we're not getting much redemption, so our, our portfolio growth, even though our new platforms are not increasing, our portfolio growth is still you know, solid. Um, but hard to say on the, on the redemptions. We, we, I, I can't tell you that, hey, we see that on the horizon and there's going to be a big wave this year, although that could occur. Um, you know, just hard to say. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that. Um, thanks for taking the questions. Thanks, Bryce. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer session. I'll now like to turn it back to Chris Oberbeck for closing remarks. Well, we want to thank uh, all of you, um, all our shareholders and everyone on this call for, for listening, for considering Saratoga, and um, we look forward to speaking to you next quarter. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect. <laughs>